Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest in the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today is a very special episode. We're welcoming back Roland Vandermeer, who is the CEO over at UpTerra, and also I am proud to announce he's also a published author in our most recent Mission Matters book. Um, first off, Roland, I just want to say, hey, welcome back and congrats. Oh, thank you, Adam. Pleasure to be here and pleasure to talk to you. All right, Roland. So uh, we, we got we got a lot to cover. Um, so first off, the title of your work in the in the most recent release was a radical breakthrough in agriculture just in time. So many concepts that you bring to light in that book. And I mean, I learned a lot and I'm sure that our readers did as well. Um, so a lot to cover on that. And I definitely want to get into this farm DJ concept um, and a whole bunch more. But, you know, you already know the drill. You've been on the show before a couple of times. So we'll start this episode the way that we start them all with our Mission Matters Minute. So, Roland, we at Mission Matters, we amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives and experts. That's our mission. Roland, what mission matters to you? Well, if you go to the biggest level I could go to, it's it's helping ourselves and humanity kind of ascend their spiritual being so we're not fighting and creating the calamities we are around the world right now. And that is the highest mission we can all probably strive for. Almost sound like a beauty pageant. But, you know, world <laughs> peace. but uh, it really is the mission of all of us to kind of find peace and harmony amongst all of us. And along with that, this planet, the environment. And mm -hmm. that's where I'd focus my energies mostly. Yeah. No, it's great. And it's great to have you part of our Mission Matters community and in this book. And the more that I've gotten to know you and also about your background. And so I, I do want to go into your background a bit because, and, and when I, when I kind of tee this up, I'm going to be stereotyping a little bit. So friend of the VCs out there, if you're offended, Hey, okay. Uh, <laughs> but you know, in your background, I mean, you were, you had quite a VC career and you, you know, you, in, in the book, you're taught, you talk about your rise and then maybe at some point having this change of heart and figuring out like there's this amazing story tell about about, you know, maybe it's not just about this money and that there's higher purposes and higher ideals and higher beliefs that we could be striving for. Maybe, you know, just to kind of stick in those early days a little bit and we'll and we'll take some time unpacking that. Like, tell us a little bit more about kind of how you got started in that build up. Yeah, so, so, so I'm an engineer, uh, education-wise, went to University of Pennsylvania, also went to the Wharton School at the same time, and just kind of threw that degree in there, because I think business is more about learning than it is about education. Um, and as an engineer, I worked in communications, and I was very fortunate, and a few years out, I got involved with venture capital and joined a firm, a pretty uh, major firm at the time, it's called Hybrid and Quist, and then it, about two years there, we realized we had to start our own venture in communications, early stage startups. And this was 80s bad you mid late 80s. And, um, and for, for context there first, maybe some of our, our younger listeners. So the VC scene, you know, 80s, I mean, it's nothing like it is now where it was kind of it's kind of common knowledge of these these ideals or, you know, other things like t tell us about the 80s and what the VC scene was there, because I like to know. <laughs> yeah, I, I got the fortunate uh, experience of working with some of the original VCs in the whole industry that came wow. out of mostly semiconductor areas, you know, deep communication stuff. The guys who formed Sequoia Capital, for instance, who Don Valentine, Pierre Lamont, and a whole bunch of other luminaries that were around at that time. And the group I was with was the next generation being trained by those guys, in effect. Um, so very early on, they were operationally oriented, very much, you know, how do we change you know, the world? How do we make things different? It rarely was about money, okay? It wow. was really about how do we do this better and let's create something very cool. Um, really? That's interesting. I, I, yeah, and they were tough. I mean, they're tough yeah. operating people and they really had great backgrounds and operations. And I'm just a few years out of, you know, industry, so to speak, didn't have that. So I had to learn a lot very quickly. Uh, hmm. But it was a fantastic time. Um, my mentor was an amazing human being who was happened to be a communication analyst uh, for, in technology and uh, one of the best in the industry. And he basically said, you know, he brought me on and let me run and gave me all his network and contacts and says, go for it. And I had to mm -hmm. figure it out. And I just used him as a guidepost. And it was an amazing experience to have that. Um, the store, first startup I did was I was 28, 29, um, no, 28. 
um, wow. Pair Gain Technologies. And I wrote a $250,000 check, jumped into CEO because there was no CEO. <laughs> I had the first CEO to replace me because I was not a CEO. Yeah. Um, and a year and a half later, I had to you know, exit him and put in a new one. Then I had to do it again, jump in again for a while. So mm. this we were learning a lot. But the technology was so advanced, which I found him pretty good intuitive about technologies and what's coming and what makes sense. And it took a while, but eventually that company goes public and becomes worth and gets sold for $3 billion. And that's an early 90s money. That's not in yeah. 2000 money. So very different experience there. Um, but those are the kind of mentorship I had and training I had. And I was never afraid to jump into a company because I always said, if I'm going to invest in something, I want I probably want, I want to run it. Even though I didn't have the skills many CEOs do, I would just jump in and get things started and make it happen. And just to correct something, by the way, I'm no longer CEO at Aptera. I'm actually executive chairman again because I found the CEO that's going to take us to the next level, which mm -hmm. was my job to do. And that just happened within a few weeks ago, literally. So really exciting time. And, and now I'm, again, get to be chairman, uh, which is executive chairman, which is helpful, operational in some sense, but really again, working at a higher level. Um, wow. Yeah, no. And, it's, and it's, first it's, off, first off, congrats. I mean, that's uh, that's it. So that's so I, I know when we as we've uh, kind of gotten to know each other over the years, and when you were at least been at least a year, we've been working with each other. Um, like uh, you were you were CEO back then. So yeah, man, we should have had that updated. I didn't know. So that's breaking news here too. Congrats. Yeah, that's a big yeah. deal. Yeah, it's it's we just closed our financing um, as well. So it's it's very exciting times, and we're moving space at the same time. So. All this is happening, and this very, is so reminiscent of my first venture that I did. I said sold for three billion, so we're kind of on the same path. Okay, yeah, a little foretelling there. Um, but you know, the most important part of my background is I was never afraid to jump into things and, mm. and make things happen and take a risk. And mm. it, it's just what your passion. If you drive by passion, you know, sensible passion, but passion with discernment, it usually is a good indicator. This is what you should be doing. You know, this yeah. is what feels right. Yeah. And I did that a long time. And yeah. um, then I, this is what you mentioned. So it, it happened. And then all of a sudden there was a, like the rise and then the fall. Literally, mm -hmm. when I switched to a fear, like in 2000 hit the dot-com bust happened. Mm -hmm. People were like scared. There was no more money. You know, what are we going to do? The venture industry kind of collapsed. Mm -hmm. uh, and funny thing, when you said venture, in the 80s, when you said venture capital, people said, what are you talking about? Ad <laughs> adventure capital? What is adventure? That's a good word, adventure capital. No one knew it. Today, it's like commonplace. But then yeah. I couldn't, you could fill out on a form. They say, what are you talking about? What's that? So they didn't understand. But that changed. Okay, that's changed. So 2000, things really got tough. And then it got tough mm -hmm. again in 2008. But I, I went into a fear mode, like, how are we going to make money? How are we going to do this? How can we succeed? And that begins a process of making decisions based on fear instead of passion and love. You know, mm -hmm. and really, that's kind of what I write about a little bit. When you're in a mode of fear, you constrict yourself. You constrict your opportunities. And that's, it took me a long time to work through that, a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, emerging out of that now and working out of passion and you know, drive and love, actually. Yeah. I use the word love, not like you think gooey and all that stuff. Yeah, like yeah. An intense passion inside that feels really good. And, and mm. that's, that's, that's the creative juices that are flowing. And when people are working in that mode, they're really unstoppable. I want to circle back to something that, that you mentioned and, um, and, and just kind of, cause I'm curious. So the, you, you mentioned in your, you know, in your late twenties, you, you know, you, you were brought in and, and you, you jumped in the CEO role, but you knew you wouldn't ultimately be the CEO. You, and you said, I think twice already. So I, I'm not the CEO. Like, that's not what you want to do or your aim. Like, like, how did you know that so early on? Like, that's really interesting. Yeah, I guess, you know, a, a, a good CEO has so many skills. I mean, and management of people is one of them and getting people to operate the highest possible yeah. Um, ability they can patience. And, and, patience and, and holding people accountable, which yeah. is one of the hardest things to do. Okay. Mm. To hold them accountable. There's a great story, the seven fable of the CEO, whatever. It's a great story. It's about that mm. thick. I love books that are that thick. Cause they yeah. tell you everything you need. Um, <laughs> Cause I don't want to read a big book, <laughs> um, but um, it, it's amazing that, you know, those people that have both vision capability and hold people accountable, bring in the right people. So there's that. And what I'm really good at is creating vision and ideas and inspiring people. 
But the accountability part, I've been, yeah, go do it. Because that's what I did. I just went yeah. and did it. And a lot of people can't operate that way. You know, a lot of people need a little more guidance, a little more coaching, a little more hands-on. And there's training behind that. There's people mm -hmm. that are really good at that. And, and that is super essential, I found. Um, it's also attention to details, which I can do at times, but not consistently. Mm -hmm. So I love working on the more inspired realm and, and coming out with some vision pieces and stuff like that and, and, and seeing what a good... So I facilitate a good entrepreneur, a good CEO to kind of do what they're here to do and augment that a little bit. And that I found my best role ever. Yeah, that, that's interesting that, that you knew that at that young of an age. And obviously to see that come full circle, because that's, I mean, 28, when I think about that, and especially because you wrote the check too, you said, you know, you wrote a good size check. So I feel like most 28 year olds, especially in, um, in today's world where you have like the glamorized CEO position of this and that, I, I, I guess I shouldn't be saying this, but I will. I'm like, the CEO position is not like when you just said that, I'm, I think in my head, I'm like, wow, should I like it? <laughs> we don't <laughs> like, how do you know? Like, that's why I said I was curious. But at that age, that's, that's super interesting to me because I feel like most 28 year olds and just many people that watch this maybe haven't even considered, um, you know, on the entrepreneurial side that there's different types of entrepreneurs. Maybe you're a builder, maybe you're, you know, better at the early stage. Maybe you're not made to do the operational side as it gets to different levels. And that doesn't mean that you have to stop the growth of your business. It means that maybe there's a, another way to think of it. So I, I like that you bring that out. Yeah. And, and the thing, Adam, I also found is you build a, a network of mentors, not mm -hmm. just one mentor, a network of mentors, because everybody brings a different skill set. And that first venture I told you about, I put a board together of VCs that all brought a different skill. One was a mm -hmm. really pedigree VC that knew his venture skills really well. One was an operating guy who knew how the manufacturing worked. And one was a technology worked at a customer of ours. I put them on the board and it was like fantastic. So we had all the coaching that was kind of what I thought we could do because I didn't have that skill, but I did know the product side. So mm -hmm. my skill set was knowing where the product should go, could go, and would make sense in the market. That's what I brought to the table. The rest of it didn't have it. So I had to augment myself. And I always thought of that. If you're starting a company, find the people that coach you and the skills that you are weakest in. Mm -hmm. Okay, not the ones you're strongest in. That's not what you need. Mm -hmm. and, and that really helps a lot. And a good CEO will do that. Generally, I find a CEO usually picks one board member to work with most closely, but mm -hmm. all those board members can help in different capacities or mm -hmm. mentors outside of that. And now today, the I think the co getting coaching outside of the board, because mm -hmm. a board is still your financial investor generally, yeah. and you're not going to open up everything there. Okay. So you need some mm -hmm. outside coaching too. And that's important to find as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, today I have four or five different coaches I talk to probably once a month, once every two months, mm. just to tune into something I'm feeling is off, you know, kind of thing. And that is super mm. essential. Yeah. I'm a big, big fan of coaching and mentoring. So it's great. And the, and people that have been watching this show for a long time know that. And I love for them to hear it from somebody like yourself. So that's great. Um, I want to, I want to getting back to, had, had to go on that side, side uh, tangent because I, it's super interesting to me still, but um, your, your transition. So at some point, you know, further down the line, you know, things didn't, the, the shakeup we'll say, and you find this like idea, like you're looking, you're not, no longer operating out of fear you're, or you're on that path to no longer doing that. And then you figure out like there's some higher purposes or some higher callings. Like tell me maybe a little bit more about that, that point in your life. Yeah. So, so one thing I will tell you when I was in that mode, I would never say I was operating out of fear. I would say, I'm right. I got it. This is what I have to do. It's the market. There's it's something no, else, right? There was like, no issue of fear. I would never have said that. In fact, yeah. someone said, this is whole coaching on fear. I said, what am I afraid of? I've got it all. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. But underlying that, there's a great quote, fear and all its children. Okay. So fear has many, many manifestations. And, and you got to wow. remember that. It's a beautiful line. So what happened next is I start working, looking at the environmental side. One, I was tired of communications. Two, it became about digital media. And I thought, what else could I do? And a friend of mine was working on the environmental side, looking at how do you do, um, how does mankind live on this planet with when, yeah. you know, waste, water, agriculture, all these things are in trouble right now, right? I mean, really in trouble. And, and we can think of everything we're facing right now on this planet is, is mounting up right now. And we're in a world of hurt if we don't focus on this soon. And I've been saying this for 15 years now. 
But that started driving me towards helping build firms and real assets, which is investing in ag, energy, water, mm -hmm. waste, you know, food, whatever, um, to create projects and systems, you know, that basically can um, ameliorate the situation. But that wasn't doing it either. And I have mm -hmm. created three firms that are doing really well. And then I kind of had an epiphany and it was like a um, uh, shock to the system of like, what are we here for? And I met some people that kind of coached me. This world is about resonance and frequencies. And it had to do with a spiritual awakening, almost not yeah. religious, but spiritual. Like we are here on this planet for a reason to learn a lot, but we're here to experience our bodies. We're here to kind of create anything you want to create. You can create on this planet. And three, the most important part, and I say this to my team all the time, we're here to connect with our hearts. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to connect to people because I would never harm another individual if you really connect with somebody. It's when you don't connect with them, yeah, you don't care. But when you do, you would have a conversation, okay? And you see where it goes. And you might not agree, but at least you, you yeah. realize you're one of the same, right? Mm -hmm. So once that began to happen and everything was about frequency, I thought I started seeing the technologies that are coming out of that world. And that's when I began to say, aha, these are the solutions. It's about resonance. It's what Einstein, Tesla, all these guys were talking about. And everything has a vibration to it. Everything has a frequency. Mm -hmm. And when you tune into it, you can see some people vibe really high. Like you, Adam, actually vibe pretty high. You're kind of a positive being. It's a lot of energy. You walk into a room, people resonate with you right away. Mm -hmm. Because you're carrying a lot of energy. And people that are either sad or not feeling good or whatever, you'll see that there's not much energy coming out of that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's systemic. But you can heal all that. So when you begin to realize this, this world is physics. This is all about physics now. Mm -hmm. You start to look at the physics behind it and they don't, an atom is a metaphor for something that might exist, but they can't ever find it because it doesn't really exist. Remember the Heisenberg yeah. uncertainty principle. It's a probabilistic thing where it is, when it is. So everything's a metaphor we're trying to explain this realm to, but it's mm -hmm. an energy, it's a vibration. So we, you know, I decided to focus on agriculture and water mm -hmm. and water is the most fundamental thing we don't understand we think water is all the same it is so not it is so mm -hmm. amazing it stores information and you can look at all sorts of things like emoto or veda austin who i had speak yesterday this is incredible photography where you put a pitcher underneath a petri dish of water you pull the pitcher away you freeze the petri dish and there's the imprint of the pitcher in there like and wow. water will give its own interpretation of that pitcher it's amazing stuff like how does water do that Okay, it holds information. <laughs> is it conscious? What is it doing? How do, water stores, it's a liquid crystal. And we know that now, and I can show you that in our lab, how we make it a, more of a liquid crystal. Crystals store information all the time. You, IBM, Sony, all these guys are doing amazing stuff with crystals now in storage, and they have been for years. Water can do the same thing, and it's a liquid form of it. So if you know how to play with it, work with it, you can then create different things. And what we do here is energize water called structured water, and you might Google that or whatever and see Wikipedia says, oh, it's not really that real. It is very real. Mm -hmm. Drink structured water. Your dog knows it. Your cattle know it. Everybody, your cat knows it. Structured water is healthy for the bean, for the cells. So crops know it too. So we structure water, but at 1,000 to 2,000 gallons a minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's really fast versus, you know, just for a glass of water is something much easier to do. Mm -hmm. And that's step one. That's just energizing it. And what we say, we can reduce the amount of water consumption because it's more bioavailable, that structured mm -hmm. water. Nature structures water. And bioavailable, just for everybody watching, that means that the ability for the, like to absorb the water and is, is higher. Is that right? Am I off? Exactly. Your yeah. body will take it much faster. The crop yeah. will take it much faster. It just, it's easier to bring into the aquaporms, which are the little venturi mm -hmm. tubes that the cells take the water through. Yeah, okay, that that's known. And so on a, on a high level, so if it's more, if it's if it's more bioavailable, like whether you're just easy side of things, is that in theory, if somebody's if if you're drinking water and you have a higher bioavailability level, then your body absorbs much more, more water that you're drinking and not you know expelling it. Then maybe you have to drink less. Is that is that? Am I kind of getting it? I just want to make perfectly, sure perfectly. That's it. That's, and just like the crops, they need less water, and there's the mm -hmm. reduction right there. So it's there. the same thing as what I just said in the body, but for the crops. Exactly, and yeah. and by needing, and it's also more energizing. Remember, cells mm -hmm. want to be energized, so it's you also know, better water. <laughs> It's better. You can even think bad water, structure it, and it's okay because your vibrance of your cell is so much higher, it'll wow. ward off all the pestilence in there. And that's remarkable, okay? Yeah. So by, higher charge is what your body wants. That's why you take antioxidants. Mm -hmm. Oxidation creates lower charge. 
but and give it more electrons, donate electrons, you get charge. And that's what your body wants. Vitamin C is good for that, right? So the water now structured is really good, but that's just step one. And, and this is where it gets really magical, okay? Because everything's a vibration. So mm -hmm. when I discovered this, I was like, wow, this is amazing. And these guys are doing this. These inventors were amazing. So I was like, I got to help them. So we funded it, we seeded it, and we started developing you know, the technologies to roll out to market. And as a punchline is we're in over 200 farms and we're growing rapidly now, 30,000 acres. And these are big wow. farms. These are yeah. the traditional Midwest farmers out there, as well as the California farmers, which I said, it's a different market out here because it's mm -hmm. higher value crop. But when you're doing corn and soy and peanuts mm -hmm. and cotton, you got to be right down the middle and really have a cost effective solution. Mm -hmm. So, so first thing is structuring it and that's energize the water. The next thing, and this is where it gets interesting. Remember, everything has an energy and a frequency. Uh, mm -hmm. A fertilizer has a certain frequencies components to it. Well, what if we can capture those frequencies, capture the resonance of it, put it on the spectrometer, you can see the frequency pattern of the fertilizer, and we can digitize that, and then we can impress it into the water, and the water takes it to the plant, and the plant says, I recognize that it's nitrogen, the vibration yeah. of nitrogen. Because really, remember, nothing in this world touches so what's really happening is the frequencies are evolving. So we put the frequency there. The plant recognizes it as nitrogen or whatever fertilizer mm -hmm. we have at the time. And it says, aha, I got it. And it grows as if it was the real thing. Wow. And that to me was mind blowing when I saw that. And like we've been demonstrating that in our lab for a few years. And now we've been in the field for three years with major, major product evaluations going on. And that's why farmers are really excited about what we're bringing forward. And that's so that sounds to me, I mean, um, I think you know this about me, Roland, but I'm not a farmer. Um, so I so but it sounds to me like pretty common sense, right? So you can decrease costs um, while having a lot of other benefits there, like just on surface value. Like if I don't know anything about the let's just say part two of what you mentioned, because I don't I don't quite grasp it, which I do, by the way, it's amazing. But but even just on surface value, like for the farmers and the business side, not just that it's right to do, and I, this is kind of where I want to go with it next, is like why it's right to do it for the planet and for the other things um, that are, that, that the other implications, because in, your, in the book, in the beginning, especially the way that you open up talking about, you know, sustainable industry, um, that maybe yeah. comment a little bit on that, but just even on surface value for the business case for the farmers, I mean, it's just, it's just straightforward common sense, right? <laughs> Yeah, it, it is. It, and that's where the economics apply. They're always looking for a yield bump and we give it to yeah. them too, but we're also looking for a cost reduction and less environmental damage because yeah. the more we take out of the field, in the lab, we grow with only water and frequency. We don't use any inputs whatsoever. Okay? Wow. We use control all the time. It works fine. In the real world, you got a lot of stuff going on. You've got yeah. sun out there. You've got 120 degree days yep. that are nailing the crop. You have all this stuff. You have tornadoes coming through and washing sure. out the crop. So you got to be careful about that. But over time, this is, I think, the solution that we all need. And we're seeing the same thing happen with cattle. Remember, mm -hmm. it's high vibe water with yeah. poultry, all that stuff. So this is, this is what's developing right now. And I want to comment about the, you know, why we're ultimately doing this. This is not about just building a multi-billion dollar company as yeah. you, know, you can do with this technology. This is really about bringing this to the world because we can reduce the cost of farming from hundreds of dollars an acre to tens of dollars an acre. We have wow. no physical costs. And that's what changes the equation. And it's working in resonance with nature, in harmony with nature, not fighting it, not killing things. Because that while it works short term, nature is so fast. In fact, glyphosate, this horrible chemical that you know kills weeds and help farmers for a while, is now... There are weeds out there that just get angry when you spray it. They turn redder and meaner. <laughs> it's like wild. So they become resistant, they become tolerant, and they go right through it. Just like we see in penicillin, all the antibiotics, same thing. You cannot beat nature at its own game. It is so fast mm -hmm. and so quick. So we don't try to. We work in harmony with it. I'll, I'll give you a great for instance. This is an example that brings it home. So aphids. Aphids are like a curse for growers, whether you're a marijuana grower or a lettuce grower or whatever. Mm -hmm. Aphids are out there and they munch away. So how do you get rid of them? Well, you can spray this stuff, but lo and behold, they got resistant to a lot of the stuff they get, yeah. you know, they've been spraying and that's because they, you overuse it. Okay. Everything overused, nature will adapt. Okay. Ladybugs are their nemesis, right? Ladybugs mm -hmm. love eating aphids. It's like 
It's like dessert, like <laughs> cotton candy, ice cream, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So they hightail it out of there when their ladybugs are there. They just don't want to be there. So people came up with a pheromone solution and those companies have done really well. Pheromones of ladybugs. Really mm -hmm. great. Aphids take off. Okay. We use the frequency of ladybugs. Okay. The wow. actual frequency and the X what? The aphids take off. That's a great example of how powerful this technology can be. Okay. We don't harm them. We just make it an environment they don't want to be in anymore. Yeah. And that, that, that's the essence of what we're doing here. And it's all underlies as water is our carrier for all this stuff. And mm -hmm. it works really well. So, so we're really excited about that. The other aspect of what we're doing in general, and this applies to all industries, this stuff we're talking about residents working in nature applies to mm -hmm. all industries. And you mentioned in the beginning, when I lecture at any of the business schools, you can name, you have to do it once in a while. Um, I talk about, and I start out with name one industry that's sustainable today. Name mm -hmm. one. And there's not an answer to that. There is none. We are extracting mm -hmm. more than we are putting back all the time. And this earth has been benevolent enough to kind of be graceful enough to let us do this. Mm -hmm. That is stopping now. We're seeing all the effects of that happen. And mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about carbon in the atmosphere because I don't believe that it's only that problem. But you can say we have poisoned our water, we have poisoned our food, mm -hmm. we, uh, our land, we have poisoned the air, we put chemicals in there that don't belong. Well, what mm -hmm. do you expect the earth to do? What do you expect us to do? And we're experiencing all the issues of that in our bio bodies mm -hmm. because we're taking all that in. So we have to change all these industries. And we focus on agriculture and water. We can mm -hmm. do the same with water. Um, you know, and I think that's a really good place to start because those were some of the most destructive things we're doing. Energy would be a good one. And um, to go after next and work in resonance in harmony with nature. And it's possible. Yeah. I've seen enough out there. It's coming. It's just coming way too slowly. Hmm. And so one of the things that you mentioned as well was just like the, the implications of what this can do. Of course, you, it's already, I mean, in a lot of farms and it's going to continue to grow. Right. And I'm sure, it, you, as you said, it's on it's on pace to do what it's supposed to do. Now it's executing. But one of the things that you did say also was um, was uh, international. So like the implication of what this could do international. So like, does this affect, I don't know, the farmer in, in Africa or, or somewhere else like in the, in, in the near future? And if so, like, like what would be your vision for that? Yeah. So, so we're still a startup. I mean, we're yep, for maybe sure. just under 20 people right now and we're mm -hmm. learning how to scale our systems right now because we're going from hundreds of farms to thousands next year. Yep. And um, this is, this is a big leap. And I, I was there at, initially in some of the bigger services companies call America online, eBay, whatever. And I watched their CTO, Google, Facebook went through it. Every generation of technology, when they have to shift every few years because they're growing so fast, they can't yeah. do it. So we've built a core set of systems that work for tens of farms. Now we just build one for hundreds of farms. And mm -hmm. now we're going to up that to thousands. Okay. So that's one. And every time I get a call from Africa, from South America, whatever, say, can you help us here right now? We could, but if, unless we have our ducks in order here, we're not going yeah. to do it well. So we've designed the system to scale. We've designed the whole solution to be more like a cable TV model where you have the set-top box and mm -hmm. we broadcast remotely our systems and solutions to it. So it's a services model. So we've changed it all to a services model so we can roll it out globally. We can scale yeah. it faster. And that'll come next year will be our first forays into the international realm. Mm. And some European countries, some African countries, some Latin American countries will be talking to us. And we're going to try a few, but very carefully. And then yeah. the following year, I think then we go hit it harder. Okay. So mm. all this is happening. It, it's, there's so many lessons I learned from tech, like the cost of a, the consumer equipment, the premise equipment, the premise mm. equipment, call it that. The set-top boxes of old were like that big. I mean, they were yeah. big, big things that you remember them. Now it's like a little, little box, a yeah. like little tiny thing, okay? I remember my first one. I saw that thing and it was like, I was like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> exactly. First cable box was big. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're massive. VCR. <laughs> and, and in communications, I learned, I was in the company I mentioned, we had designed a first system that cost $5,000. And the phone mm. company said, yeah, we can use about, you know, five of them, you know, 10 of them, whatever. It didn't work. But if you can price it at $100, we'll buy everything well the next year we got it down to 2000 which they bought a lot more then we got it down to 500 and they bought a lot more. then we got it down to 100 and they started going like hotcakes right yeah. and that was for digital services to the home before internet it was isdn and same thing we've done here we've started out with twenty five thousand dollars in the field we got it down to eighteen thousand. then we got it down to 12 now we're at eight 
and, wow. and, and like, but technically it's four and I see a path under a thousand, okay, within two years. So that's what we're, we're doing, the same thing. So we can bring it around the world and we don't have to manufacture the equipment. They can manufacture it. We'll provide the service. Yeah. And then it goes to the farm DJs. So what are we really doing? Mm. Remember, everything's a frequency and vibration. In fact, if you really want to... Who came up... Well, real, real quick, who came up with farm DJ? That's a good one. You know, our team... Or if so, you remember, it's our, awesome. One. Our CTO probably said it because he's, <laughs> he's this creative wizard who's amazing. And um, we were That's in the awesome. field. Shout out to him. That was great. But when I saw it, I'm like, farm DJ, come on. It's genius. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, think, think, of, think of the person with a green thumb that has plants in their house and they're singing to their plants all the time. Oh, for sure. The plants love it because they're feeling the love and the song yeah. and they like to grow in that environment. In fact, universities run the study. You play CNN in one room, not to pick on CNN, you play any of them, and then play Vivaldi in the other and put the same plants in there. Watch, they, almost, they die in the CNN room. And they thrive in the Vivaldi room, okay? So what do they want to hear? They love the, the music, okay, of the world. They love that. They love that. So we're actually feeding music to the plants, vibrations mm -hmm. they want. And literally, I'm not kid you not, while we talk about fertilizer amendments, we also play music through uh -huh. the water, okay? And, and through other means too. But it's, it's wild to think that way. And that is what we're bringing. We're bringing fidelity. So eventually, this is where this goes to. This will control the whole solution, okay? This iPhone mm -hmm. will be the solution for the farmer to pick his music for the day, for the week, whatever, that he wants to play to his crops. Mm -hmm. And that's whatever amendments and inputs. It's a frequency, and that's what we call it that. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's going. So, so this is powerful stuff coming along. It'll take a while to get there. This doesn't happen overnight, but this, is, this is building right now, and we can see the future of it. Yeah. And when you were and when you were kind of starting out, let's just say with those first few farms, like how did that go? Because these ideas and maybe this is common to maybe some some other individuals, but to me, it's completely new. And in and, and terms of like what could be done through water, like how did those that first couple get like done? Was that a what was that conversation like? <laughs> That's so, like because I'm just trying to picture it like you're like, listen, this is this, this, that like <laughs> how did that go? Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. So we actually had to bribe our farmers to try. They're like, <laughs> we're in Oklahoma. Fair, we're fair. in Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas. I'll know. pick on myself, Roland. I used to, if we, I don't know, when we started this show, I had to beg people to come on. I'm like, just do it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, we, we'd throw a party with some beer or something like that. And they'd say, say what? What are you doing? Like, come on. And, and, and But our chief sales guy, who is an agronomist, who also said, I don't know what this is about, but pay me a... 500 bucks a month and I'll service your clients and I'll work with you. He took a device. I'll show you this one inch. This is a, like a one inch device right here. Mm. This is one of our, and he put it on his system in his yard and he grew half his yard. He, he's an agronomist, right? Like yeah, yeah. he does this on his yard, but he did. He divided rye grass. He put half no, yes and half no. And within three weeks, he's looking at it and said, holy shit. Excuse me. <laughs> um, wow. He says, I can't believe it. This is really green and this is brown and it's the same water. It's like a miracle. And he was like, he was hooked. And then he started playing with it. Then he started telling his farmers, showing pictures of this. Said, okay, we'll try it. We don't believe it. We'll shoot. And we kid you not, three months later, we go out to the field. We tour with 20 farmers. We went from, with pickup trucks, farm to farm to farm in this one region. Probably spent the yeah. whole day on the road. Of course, we had an igloo cooler with a lot of beer in the back. That helped, yeah. you know. And literally went down to farm, and they started calling it magic water, God's water. This is a miracle. And <laughs> it's holy just, water. Is that? <laughs> they were blown away. And like we were too, by the way. We didn't ever see it in the real field that scale. These are 100, 200 acres. Oh, you're fields. right. So if you're looking at like that's so, so empirical. And so like if you're there, then you're like, it's so obvious. Like you can't. Can you believe your eyes? That's what there, it had to be that feeling. Oh, it was it was it was great for us. And, and two, these farmers, salt of the earth, work their butts off, super smart. Don't take fools very far. You wear the wrong shoes, they look at you and they know who you are, you know, kind of thing. And we don't pretend to be farmers. Like I can't, even though my dad lived on a farm, you know, that's where we grew up, but not me. And and it was like it was amazing to watch how they calibrated and said, okay, it works. I'm gonna try it some more. Let's put it on. I'll pay for one next year. And some of those guys have gone to install all of all their fields, which is remarkable. Some of them are just incrementing every two, every year. And now we got some very, very big product evals going on with some big names you would recognize. And if those go well, which we expect them to go well, 
you should see a huge acceleration. That's why we're looking at a really big year next year. Yeah. Man, this is, uh, it, it's a great story. And to see this happen and to see something that's going to be, I mean, just such a win-win scenario. And then I'll throw in a di another win for, you know, the earth, which is one of the main reasons why you originally, and I should say the biggest win of them all, all right? Um, um, but that, and then one of the reasons why you originally even got into energy, the reason why you got into water, reason why you got into agriculture was because of that, trying to do something that's more sustainable. So, I mean, it just seems like the path is set. It seems like it's going to continue to, to grow. Yeah. Um, I mean, what's next on this as you, as you kind of go on this journey? I think, I think you, I think on our offline conversations, you said you're working a lot on product side of things, but just what's next in general? Yeah, so, so the, the one empirical thing that happened this year, actually, we went to the farms we were on for two years now, and our, our agronomist, our chief sales guy, goes out there, and he starts digging up the dirt and says, look, and he has a video on TikTok. He's all over TikTok now. It's hilarious. So I'm like, this guy is not an actor, but he, he's credible, man. That's and awesome. um, he pulls up the dirt, and he says, look at these earthworms. When do we see earthworms in our cornfields? Like, literally. And he goes to the... The control group and he says there's nothing here there's no work wow. there's nothing going on the soil is now richer it's organic it's sequestering carbon it's doing everything it should do and it happened because they applied the technology and they backed off of other things and that's what's going on so we're seeing soil improve year over year which is exactly what we thought would happen so that gives us a lot of confidence so you need less water every year you know that's yeah. really important less inputs every year once you get that organic mass going, you can do a lot with the soil. That's what you want. And that's the earth reclaiming itself. Wow. And, uh, and I have to bring this one out because I'm grateful that you made time for us right now because um, I know you're in the middle of a move. What's harder, a ho home move or a business move? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, when you start operating in a, fear, a place of joy and love, if you will, okay, like we didn't have a place last week. We didn't have a place to go to. And like yesterday signed an agreement, found some containers to move things separately, and we're all set. Like, everything's done, and we're going to have it done. And, like, and this is one week to go. We have to be out of here in seven days, right? <laughs> so it, it can happen if you just don't fear and let things evolve. Yes, be smart, but be, basically trust in the process. If you're on the right track, things will open up for you as you see. Yeah, it's great. Well, Roland, I just have to say, um, I, I really appreciate you again, making some time for us coming on the show today. And I'm so thrilled about what's going on at Uptera. And I'm happy that I got to witness, you know, some of the, some of the earlier um, Uptera all the way up to now in this next transition period. And next time you come on the show, we'll update your title. Don't worry. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Michael um, and his CEO would like that too. <laughs> absolutely. And we'll have to, we're going to have to talk to him too, because as this thing gets bigger and bigger, I want to definitely, um, we're, we're not going anywhere. I want to keep following and covering the Uptera journey and really bringing that to our audience because it's next level. And to me, I mean, it's just inspiring. It's like that it gives me as an entrepreneur and as a business owner an idea of like, OK, the way that things have always been done. I mean, there, there's other ways to approach. There's other ways to look at a, at, a, at, a, at a problem. And we don't have to throw up our hands and say that's just the way it is. I mean, if you were talking to your, you know, early 20s self and if you were to say, hey, one day you're going to be talking about vibrations and water and how you can like, I don't know what you would have like told that older role in self, but probably would have been like, do I go, what, what do I turn into? Like, yeah. But like uh -huh. that crusade and that, like that, you know, that evolution that we have as people, as we mature and have different perspectives, I just think it's admirable. And I think it's inspiring. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. I appreciate you and all the work you're doing. It's remarkable. And I really appreciate the mission you're on a lot. Awesome. If, uh, if somebody wants to learn more about Uptera, by the way, um, what's the best way for them to follow the journey? Because uh, this is one and I know they're going to be hearing it more and more as time goes on. So how, how do people like follow the journey? Our website's up and active and it's getting a regen again. Um, so it's going to keep on going. We're going to have a lot up there. And then we're on TikTok and Instagram and all that stuff that's moving along nicely. So yeah. just follow us that way. Or if you really want to know more and go deep, contact me and I'm rolling out of Terra. So uh, it's really yeah. easy to find me. 
Fantastic. And we'll, we'll put that information, all the links to the website and that kind of stuff in the show notes so that our audience can, uh, can just click on the links and head right on over. And speaking of the audience, uh, if this is your first time with Mission Matters or engaging in an episode, we're all about bringing on business owners, entrepreneurs, executives, and experts and having them share their mission, the reason behind their mission, you know, why they do what they do, like how are they out there in the, in the world and in the marketplace making a difference. Uh, if that's the type of content that sounds interesting or fun or exciting to you, we welcome you. Hit that subscribe button. We have many more mission-based individuals coming up on the line, and we don't want you to miss a thing. And now roll in until the next time. Thanks again for coming on, and congrats again on the book. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate it.